So hello again, we're back on. It's now uh, Sunday about midday, so uh, I'm gonna continue with this uh, list of questions here and uh, hopefully we'll finish up here today. Um, so this is a section on becoming a potter. So I'll ask the questions that are listed here and try to answer them as best I can. Uh, first one is what inspired you to become a potter? And uh, I, I guess the, the inspiration came a little bit later it was more a curiosity at first um, I had seen a little bit of uh, handmade pottery uh, and was looking for an alternative to the education system I was in and uh, just decided I would get a uh, uh, kit to build a kick wheel with uh, it's a foot powered wheel uh, some clay and uh, some instructional books and uh, see what happened and uh, I did all that I built this kick wheel a big wooden frame kick wheel and um, got 50 pounds of clay and a book that kind of had step-by-step uh, -step photographs and written descriptions of uh, uh, how to make pieces from start to finish and I began that way. Um, I would I would set the book next to me. I would sit at the wheel, and uh, uh, there were a series of pictures from centering to opening to forming to from like I say start to finish. And I would sit there until um, I got as close on the piece I was working on to the pictures in the book in this step-by-step uh, -step process and I just spent hours a day doing that and uh, the inspiration really came as I began to understand that the process of making uh, pieces out of clay and really the uh, process is still what inspires me I just like the idea of taking a lump of something that you can find in any corner of the earth and making something out of, with your hands that uh, through the process of the uh, making, forming, drying, firing, glazing, and firing again, you have you basically made something that's uh, almost permanent. I mean, it will outlast uh, many lifetimes and uh, so that that continues to inspire me today so that that is kind of how it began for me and the next question is where did you get your start so I just explained where I got my start and then after I reached a point where I felt like I, I really needed some hands-on instruction and I needed some um, I, I needed the ability to watch someone who was already skilled at work uh, in the process. So I, I spent four years at a place in New York called the Clay Art Center and it was a, a working uh, studio full of artists who were all independent but um, kind of sharing a communal space and that is basically for the four years that I spent there it's where I learned everything I I've, I've, uh, was able to uh, from making pottery to um, building kilns and repairing them and building wheels and uh, formulating clay out of uh, component materials and glazes the same way how to mix them and how to apply them and uh, it was a very valuable four years for me and uh, it's, it's where I was at the end of those four years felt uh, I was ready to uh, strike out on my own and uh, that's what I did at the end of the four-year uh, period at Clay Art Center. So the next question is, where did you learn ceramics education? Well, again, I just kind of described with a, uh, the education for me was at the uh, Clay Art Center, and it was actually owned by a Japanese potter who um, had a very uh, sort of an Asian aesthetic. Uh, There's a tradition of apprenticeship and uh, working in Japan uh, where people will work for years and years under a master um, you know starting out uh, by doing very menial work and not even not even getting the chance to 
to make things for sometimes many years. It's not so much the tradition today, but it, it's historically how they've worked in Japan. So he was very much of that aesthetic, and it was very important to him that um, you develop skills by repetition and by by you know not not uh, progressing too quickly through the process, but rather concentrating on each aspect of the of the process during the making, and then uh, developing a sense for design of forms, designs with glazes, and uh, how firing affects the work, and all of that um, uh, was kind of the, the foundation for uh, what I was able to do once I left there and was able to set up my own place here. So, um, And next question is, how long have you been throwing? That uh, period for me began, oh, hate to say it, but about 44 years ago. So I've, I've been at it that long, and uh, it, it sometimes I, I would think five years into it, oh, I've got this all figured out, and then uh, a couple of years later I would look back at pieces I was making back when I thought I had it all figured out, and, and I, I saw that, yeah, I was still missing a lot of... Uh, a lot of the finer points. I mean, you, you can develop quickly in terms of being able to make a form, but, but the, the kind of the details and the um, being able to uh, envision a form and be able to make it, uh, it, it takes a long time to, to get that skill. So um, it's been a long time, and I'm, I'm still at it and still enjoying it too. So uh, next one, do you mass produce your work? Um, I make multiples of a lot of different pieces, um, but we do it, it, it's all a hand process, so it's not, uh, it's not a mechanized process, but, but we do make, uh, I will make mugs a hundred at a time and other pieces, you know, dozens at a time, um, but it's all, uh, as I say, hand done, I mean, everything, e each piece is individually made, you know, we have, uh, three people working in the studio, so we're all working on 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 different parts of the process uh, throughout the work cycle that sort of revolves around a firing of our our large gas kiln once a month. So for three three and a half weeks, we're all we're we're making stuff. We're making a lot of pieces and uh, finishing them, glazing them, and then we get them ready to to fire about once a month. So we fire about twelve times a year. Um, what is your favorite piece to throw? I, I would say probably a uh, a bowl form, an open, uh, wide form that uh, is a very simple shape. But uh, again, simplicity is sometimes very deceiving in in terms of the way something appears uh, simple uh, with clean lines and a continuous curve and those things that you kind of take for granted uh, on a uh, what a piece is supposed to look like, uh, but those things are very hard to to achieve. And I've I've developed a very critical eye over the years for sort of imperfections and if if lines don't you know continue uh, the way they should, if there's interruptions, if the force form isn't uh, you know crisp and and tight. Uh, sometimes the, uh, the the piece doesn't look as finished to me. So um, the bowl shape, though, is is one that I keep going back to, and, and probably is is my favorite piece to to make. And maybe after that, uh, pitchers and and uh, teapots are kind of a close second and third. Um, how many pieces do you make in a day? Uh, again, that that depends on what pieces I'm making. If I'm making mugs, I can make a hundred in a day. Um, if I'm making pitchers or casseroles or something like that, it's more a dozen, two dozen, and then uh, that assumes that like the next day is going to be spent finishing all those pieces. In, in other words, trimming them, uh, making and attaching handles if I need to. If pieces have lids, those have to be dealt with. So 
Uh, there's no set number of pieces that I make in a day, and it, and it really varies by the type of piece that I'm making. Um, when creating a four-piece set, is it challenging to create similar structures? It is, um, but you figure out over time what sort of consideration you have to give to make a we'll call it a matching set but nothing ever ever matches but if you're trying to get uniformity in a series of pieces like a canister set or a set of dishes um, the the best thing to do is begin with the if you, if you want the pieces to be uh, rel relatively identical in size then you be you, you begin with the same amount of clay. In other words, you would weigh out a, an amount of clay that you need for a certain piece, and then if you're going to make multiples of that piece, uh, you use the same amount of clay. Um, and that, uh, again, with practice and over time, that will uh, give you the ability to, to achieve uniformity in the pieces if that's what you're trying to, to do. So it's important that you that you take that kind of thing into consideration. If you want to make something that the same size as a piece you've already made, well, it's good to know how much material you started with to make that piece originally and then uh, attempt again to use the same amount of clay to uh, repeat that shape. So uh, that's what I would say about that. Uh, how do you make such uniform pieces and keep them so consistent? I have never been able to create a set of really similar pieces. Well, again, um, I would say just the important thing is starting with the same amount of material, uh, paying close attention to the piece. Let's, let's say you're satisfied with the piece that you've made and you want to make multiples of that piece or pieces similar to it. It's very important to, to sort of pay close attention to everything you did during the forming process of that piece that the piece that you like that you want to repeat because that way you can then sort of in your mind refer back to a certain way you like maybe closed in the form or opened it up or uh, left a thickness at the lip that you like so you have to keep all those things in mind uh, when you're forming pieces so that if, if you want to uh, continue that form or explore it further you have a like a foundation a basis to start with um, so I, I would say again, it's just repeating and over and over again, uh, and that's that's over time is going to give you. Uh, it, it's not going to happen all of a sudden, but o over a gradual period, you'll if if you keep working at it, you'll realize that that you're getting better at it, and you're able to to do things. You, you're able to take that concept, uh, mental image that you have of a piece, and the process of, of finishing, making that piece and finishing it will gradually become easier. So it's just repetition. As most of your pieces are wheel thrown, do you ever work hand building into your pieces to add details into them or do you like to keep it more simple and focus more on keeping everything wheel thrown? No, the, the majority of the pieces I, I make are wheel thrown, but I, I do have a whole list of other things that, that I make that are uh, slab built, um, I have an extruder that I use, um, and we sometimes combine both hand building and wheel thrown pieces into into one form. Uh, but my, my main concentration is wheel throwing and uh, uh, the pieces I've, I've developed with uh, slabs, I, I've made a whole bunch of uh, what are called drape molds, where we, we have a machine that it's a slab roller that rolls out long sheets of clay. And uh, I made molds that we then take and, and drape those pieces, over the uh, clay over those pieces, the molds, and cut the edges. And, and uh, it's a whole different process, but uh, uh, it's the hand building aspect of our work is limited, but uh, it is there, um, but mostly wheel thrown work. Um, do you have any tricks or tips for quickly centering clay? Um, no, I don't. Uh, the, the, the best thing I can tell you is that it's not a, uh, 
a matter of strength as much as it is a matter of like understanding what centering is and and sort of feeling centered yourself you, you have to be able to uh, understand that that the clay has to move in the confines of where your hands are and you can't let the let the clay move your hands around you have to hold your hands firmly in position um, and let that clay find that area of center that your hands are making and and it's it's the kind of thing where um, it takes a long time at first it's the most difficult part of throwing uh, for for beginning and then then it becomes the easiest part really um, but until you you kind of have that light bulb go off over your head and understand centering and it is more understanding than actually feeling it um, it, it it's gonna take a while if, if you have to ask is it centered yet um, then it isn't and and you haven't quite gotten there but if you keep at it it's gonna be one of those things where if you're anxious to make a piece and, and you you've kind of developed your skills over time uh, centering is gonna be the easiest part you just kind of get that done and then you you begin to explore the form you want but uh, it, it does take a while and it's frustrating uh, but it comes over time um, why do you spin the wheel while removing the pieces from the bat at the same time I don't always but uh, sometimes I do that um, just because it it uh, well there are a couple of reasons Th there's one wire that I use that's kind of a uh, a twisted wire that if if you move if the, if the wheel spins as you draw that wire through it will make an interesting pattern under the wheel but it will make just as interesting a pattern if the wheel is stationary and you just sort of move it back and forth but there's no no reason for other than those design features with that twisted wire if you're using a smooth wire it doesn't really matter if the if the wheel is spinning or not when you cut it off uh, what is the benefit of using the thick plaster looking bats you have? What is the difference between the ones you use and ours at the CV studio? We have speedball plastic bats. Do you not like plastic bats or why don't you choose to use them? Okay, the, the, the plaster looking bats are actually not plaster, they're wooden. And I use them, uh, I've, I've always used them because they're easy to make. I make them, I just buy a big four by eight sheet of uh, composition board and cut them out of that. Uh, it's, a, it's an inexpensive way to make a lot of bats all at once and they last a long time. Um, I do prefer them over the, the plastic bats that you guys use there. I have found that with those, there's a little bit of flexibility to them that uh, depending on the piece that you've made on it, it can tend to like warp or just bend the edges of the piece as you, as you pick it up. There's, there's a little bit that flexibility will will move the clay, and sometimes you'll have a piece that's out around. Um, but it, it's not that big an issue, uh, and if you're careful, you can avoid that. But um, I, I just prefer prefer the uh, the bulk of the of the bats that I use and uh, just have always used them and I'm, I'm comfortable with them so uh, but uh, they're, they're no better or worse than any other kind of bat you just have to know how to use all of the tools that you use whether it's a bat or a trimming tool or a, uh, a shaping tool a modeling tool they're, they're just uh, w once you learn how to best use them uh, the, the you know everybody kind of develops their own preferences for the types of tools that they use. Um, how long do you usually let your chucks dry out for? Um, I really don't let them dry out at all, typically. I will uh, make a chuck if I'm going to use a chuck to trim a piece that has uh, uh, that is ready for trimming. What I usually do is I make the chuck, I make the opening wide enough to hold the piece, and then I may take a, a towel and just uh, as the wheel revolves, I might just um, remove the surface water uh, so that it doesn't like stick to the piece that I'm uh, uh, about to trim. But uh, you have to be very careful because if the piece you're trimming is too wet and you have the wet chuck, you're, you're going to have a problem 
removing that piece from the uh, chuck once it once you're finished trimming it. But if you're careful and the piece you're trimming is dry enough and you've gotten the surface water off of the uh, chuck, you you can trim pieces without waiting for the tr chuck to dry up. Now, there are people that use chucks that are completely dry or leather hard. Even they they will make a chuck form and bisque fire it and use it um, that way. I, I've always liked the ability to uh, have the clay in a uh, um, consistency where if I need to adjust the diameter either out or in, uh, it's still soft enough that I can do that. If, if I'm trimming a bunch of pieces that aren't all of a uniform size and maybe one's a little wider, one's a little narrower, so I'll have to kind of open and close that uh, diameter of the chuck and that's why I like to have it uh, of that consistency, a throwing consistency when I use it. So uh, now we're into the general questions. What is the thought process when you think about what you want to make and do you ever get stuck about thinking of the design? Um, yeah, I don't necessarily get stuck, but I don't, uh, at the same time, I don't like come up with uh, like a really radical new forms. My, my forms sort of evolve over time and I will notice um, if I'm making a piece uh, that maybe I came up with a design for years ago uh, and I look back at the, those ones that I made when I originally came up with a design and compare them th with ones that I'm making today, uh, they can look completely different. And I've never consciously made a, a decision to change the design, but just over time, you kind of play with new ideas, new little subtle changes, and all of a sudden you've got some thing that doesn't look at all like what you started with. So uh, in that sense, it, it, it evolves more than kind of develops suddenly. And I don't, I don't really get stuck. I sometimes get frustrated if, if uh, some forms are a little more difficult to to make than others that, uh, you know, if a, if a line isn't quite right in a piece that I've kind of thought about wanting to make and I'm, I'm not getting it, I'll, I'll, there'll be some frustration there, but I usually am able to work it out. So uh, that's the answer to that. Uh, what helps you gather ideas for when you create your pieces? Do you like to sketch them out or decide while throwing your form? Yeah, I very rarely sketch anything out. I'm, I'm not good at sketching or drawing. Uh, so yeah, I, I basically work out the forms. Uh, once I've worked them out in my head and know what I want to make, uh, it's all during the throwing process that I, I kind of work out the details. Um, do you ever think that your piece was not what you thought it was going to be while making it? If so, do you start over when this happens? Uh, I, I think the answer to that is yes and no. Uh, sometimes the piece is not what I thought it was going to be when I started out. And I think, oh, well, I better start over. And sometimes it's not what I thought it was going to be. And I think, oh, well, that's interesting. And maybe it'll inspire some new direction uh, to go with the piece, new exploration of a, of a form that I hadn't considered when I started making it. So both things, if, if the form just doesn't, for some reason please me or isn't successful, um, then I'll probably scrap it and, and start over. But it, it, a lot of times it will happen that I'll, I'll discover something in it, uh, even though it wasn't what I was starting out as, and it'll take me off in a new direction. So kind of both things can happen. Um, do you break the traditional ways to make clay, clay pieces? If so, do you encourage others to do so? Um, I think the only thing that's that's traditional in terms of making pieces is uh, that you're starting with raw clay, a raw material, and forming it with whatever method you're using, whether it's on the wheel, whether it's hand building, whether it's sculpting, whether it's coil building, um, and then continuing through the process uh, of drying, 
firing and if it if glaze is a consideration glazing and then firing again for the glaze firing um, in that sense those are the traditional ways of making things but as far as how to make things I mean the, you know to like if you are expecting perfection or uniformity or symmetry but all those things are so subjective that I, I think um, you know, beauty is truly in the eye of the beholder there and the creator. I mean, a, a lot of pieces, a lot of pieces that are my favorite pieces are very asymmetrical and rough looking. Uh, a lot of pieces that have been fired in, in a wood burning kill, for instance, have a look that you can't achieve uh, in any other types of firing. But, but uh, some of it is just... Uh, you know, it, it it's a traditional method of firing, but but it also yields results that are uh, very unique, and um, they they can't be reproduced exactly, and that's kind of part of the beauty of of that. So, um, as far as tradition goes, again, it's just like I I think it's important to have the skills to be to be able to to handle each step of the process skillfully. And with uh, techniques that are, they may be ages old and traditional, but if you can come up with methods for making things based on your skills that aren't traditional, then by all means use them. Um, how do you come up with different ways to make pieces rather than just the traditional throwing, like you did with attaching the two thrown pieces together to make the circular teapot? Well, I think ideas just kind of come to you as you're working with the material. I mean, it's that type of material that it can, it can suggest to you ideas that if you try and are successful with them, then, you know, why not kind of listen to those ideas and be open to them? So, uh, you know, if, if, if you have an idea that you've never seen put into practice before, but you think might work, try it out. You never know. So, um, what is your favorite step in the ceramics process? Um, throwing on the wheel is definitely, you know, my favorite, my favorite process, part of the process. But I would say, um, beyond that, it, you know, a, a piece that's thrown on the wheel very often needs uh, additional forming, whether it's trimming, attaching handles, or attaching other design features, um, those are all as enjoyable. And I, and I think from uh, when I look at a, a finished piece that hasn't been fired yet, but is completed in terms of it, its forming, handle attachments, and all that, uh, sometimes that piece, when it's leather hard and still has some moisture in it, that's that's kind of my my favorite um, uh, aspect of the uh, going from start to finish and making pieces, I like when they're in that condition probably the best. Um, they're not permanent at that point, but they just, there's a look to them that I, I kind of like. They're fresh. They still kind of refer to the forming process more than when they're finished. Um, but yeah, I mean, throwing on the wheel is, is my favorite, but uh, the, the, everything involved from start to finish is, is important. But, uh, you know, you, you start at that beginning and uh, go from there. On your Instagram, you make very lovely and seem to be functional pieces. Do you prefer to make functional pieces over other things, or do you sometimes play around with the different pieces you can make and different concepts? Um, function is very important to me, and uh, I, I, I like pieces that are non-functional. I don't um, very often make them, but I, I enjoy uh, using the pieces, and I enjoy the fact that other people uh, seem to enjoy that as well. So uh, function is one of those things for me that um, is important, but it it has to also be you know, something that is aesthetically pleasing too. So, um, I kind of, I kind of lean toward the functional work. Uh, I'm, I admire a lot of pieces that aren't functional, that are more sculptural or just conceptual, but, uh, 
for me it's just one of the one of the parts of the the whole process that I enjoy the functionality any tips for someone just starting in play um, I think the best thing I could tell you is don't be easily frustrated uh, don't don't give up don't um, think that it's gonna happen quickly and and stay at it I mean continue I mean watch other people that have developed skills that might be beyond yours and see what they're doing that maybe you're not able to do yet and try to put them into practice it, it helps to watch videos to to watch someone in person actually making pieces um, but the but the best advice I can give is is to just keep repeating the process I mean it is an art form but it but it's beyond that it's a craft and and any craft requires hours and years of, of dedication to developing the skills so if it's something that you find you're passionate about uh, somehow find the time to spend uh, developing your skills that's that's the best advice I could give you uh, when we all start we tend to make a lot of mistakes do you make as many mistakes now compared to when you first started uh, no I don't um, and and I say that uh, with all humility uh, only because I've, I've I've dedicated over 40 years to uh, making pottery uh, and over that course of time you eliminate a lot of the mistakes that beginners make you understand why they were mistakes when you made them uh, in hindsight usually but um, uh, given that span of time uh, if you haven't eliminated a lot of the things that were mistakes uh, you're, you're probably not uh, not in the right business so yeah o over time you you kind of the, the amount of mistakes you make sort of diminish not that they they don't happen they often do there are a lot of and there are mistakes throughout the process whether it's in the throwing the piece or handles or lids or firing firing is a big area where there are lots of mistakes and a lot of a lot of loss occurs during the firing process but you, you tend to understand why they happen over time and uh, develop the means to eliminate them so uh, that's just a natural kind of progression uh, how did you stay motivated when you started out with pottery even if you messed up a piece or two that took a while well I just made a lot of pieces so I would make pieces that maybe I did mess up and they didn't get through to completion but I was making a lot of other pieces and was able to get some finished and uh, I can still remember the excitement of getting pieces out of the first firing that I ever was part of uh, and just that the feeling of, of what that piece now looked like uh, compared with what it was like when I started uh, is it, it's a feeling that still excites me I, I still like to get those uh, finished pieces out of a firing and um, you know it helps to to be able to uh, have, have some uh, like a short amount of time between the time you kind of conceive of what you want to make and you make it and bring it to completion uh, that way you can like see if, if you've been successful with it uh, you can be inspired to continue on and make more um, but I think the the key is to make a lot of things make a lot of things don't be afraid to try things and uh, uh, get them get them through to the end um, what are your preferred tools uh, well one we talked about earlier is a is a cutting tool um, that I used just about uh, with every piece that I make uh, to cut excess clay away I have some uh, faceting tools that I'll cut straight sides into round pieces um, and small wooden modeling tools um, other than that you know my hands sponges uh, uh, basically that's the very simple uh, list of tools that I use I do use uh, shaping ribs whether they're rubber or metal uh, during the throwing process I'll, I'll use those to form uh, curves on the outside or inside of pieces depending on uh, what the piece is that I'm making but it, it's they're probably 
eight or ten tools that, that I have total that, that I depend on all the time to use. So um, there are not many, and every potter that I know uh, has their own eight or ten or however many it is that, that they uh, use and kind of count on, and it's different for each potter. So very personal choice, the tools that you use. Um, business. What is it like to run your own business and make money from your art? Well, um, since I decided that this is what I was going to do for a living, um, the, it, it's necessary to make money at it. So uh, the way I feel about it is I, I make these pieces that I then present to the public either at art shows or in galleries or online now. Um, and... I'm gratified by the fact that they have a, enough of an appeal that, that people are willing to spend money on them and provide me with the mean, means to continue doing what I'm doing. Um, so, uh, you know, I don't do it for the money, but I, like everybody else, need the money to, to maintain my life and business. And uh, uh, so I'm, I'm actually grateful to be able to do it. Um, are you at your studio full time? Uh, yes, I am and have been ever since I started. We started here back in 1980 in this studio and it's been a full time uh, job for me since then. I've never really had income from anything else uh, during the time we've been here uh, and it's always been, uh, as I mentioned, either selling right out of the studio here or going to shows or selling online or at a number of galleries that represent our work. So yes, it's a, it's a full-time thing. Uh, and I'm going to pause now just for a minute and we'll be back to finish this up.